Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Yulia Panfil. I am the director of the Future of Land and Housing Program at New America. It's been uh, nearly a year since Russia launched a full-scale invasion on the territory of Ukraine. And in that time, the Ukrainian military has fought its way to considerable battlefield success and has liberated significant territory near Kiev and in the country's east and south. But now these regions face a long road to recovery, even as Putin continues to bomb critical infra infrastructure, apartment complexes, and other civilian targets. According to a December 2022 estimate from the World Bank, Ukraine's recovery estimate is projected to cost at least half a trillion dollars. But innovative tools, funding mechanisms, and reconstruction methods can help Ukraine rebuild more efficiently, transparently, and equitably. Further, there's increased political movement in Canada, the United States, and elsewhere in the West to use seized Russian assets to help pay for this reconstruction. Today, we are pleased to host a two-part panel to discuss the question of how to rebuild Ukraine and how to make Russia pay for it. The panel, the, the event will last 90 minutes. First, we will have a technical discussion with three panelists on the question of how to rebuild uh, using new tools and methods. We'll discuss some of the challenges that the country faces from a land tenure perspective and what can be done. Uh, I will introduce those panelists in a moment. Uh, then we will move on to a discussion about how to use new and innovative financing methods to pay for this reconstruction, including a movement to use seized Russian assets to pay for the rebuilding of Ukraine. Uh, before we begin our first panel, we will see a video recorded by one of our panelists, journalist Serena Zabriski, of footage from around the country over the last year. This will be an approximately five minute video, after which time we will move into the panel discussion. Um, I'll introduce the panelists in a moment. Uh, after about 40 minutes, we will take about 10 minutes for audience Q&A, and then we will move into the fireside chat portion of uh, the event. It will be moderated by New America Vice President Peter Bergen, and will feature a conversation between uh, Ambassador David Sheffer, former US Ambassador at Large for War Crimes, and now a fellow at the Council for Foreign Relations, and the Honorable Senator Ratna Omidvar, Senator for Ontario, in the Senate of Canada. Um, why don't we move into our panel? I will introduce our three panelists and then we will uh, show the video footage. First, I am so pleased to welcome Zarina Zabriski, a uh, reporter for Euromaidan Press, as well as several other outlets who has been living and reporting from Ukraine since the beginning of the war. Uh, Next, uh, I will introduce Michael Kolod, who is the, uh, the CEO of the Peace Coalition, a technologist, and uh, also somebody who has been living in Kiev since August, working on a set of really innovative pilot projects to help rebuild uh, towns in Ukraine. And finally, Denis Nizalov, a lecturer at De Montfort University, and a land tenure expert with the Prindex project and uh, one of the architects of Ukraine's land legislation. Um, I will uh, go off video. We will watch the video uh, from Zarina and then we will move into our conversation.
thank Serena for recording and sharing that uh, video. It's very difficult to watch. Um, so why don't we start our conversation and we'll begin with you. You've obviously been um, traveling widely across Ukraine for the last year and reporting extensively on the conflict. Tell us a little bit about what daily life is like for Ukrainians right now. Well, thank you so much, Julia. Thank you, everybody on the panel and the audience for joining us. It's a very important subject, and I'm glad that we're discussing it now already. It's um, what we need to be doing. One thing I was thinking when I was looking at the title is that uh, how to rebuild Ukraine. I would rephrase it being a writer. I would say how Ukraine should rebuild itself and how we can make Russia pay for it. So to give Ukraine a little bit more agency and not a little bit more, more agency in it, because that's what Ukraine is fighting for. Uh, so first and foremost, I wanna say that I'm an observer, I'm a reporter. And although I've been living here as well, I'm certainly in a somewhat privileged position because at least I can move uh, cities for instance, uh, my home in Ukraine, my home base is Odessa, and I have a lovely little attic there, but this attic hasn't had uh, heat because it doesn't have electricity uh, and internet uh, for months now. So I kind of suffered with everybody else for a month, and then I moved on, and my job, my stories took me around, and I was able to stay in some places that had electricity or when you stay in a hotel you can choose the one with the generator when you're in ukraine now you always look for a cafe or a hotel or wherever you are heading to check for the generator even if you look on airbnb the real one not the one that people uh, book to help ukrainians it will say generator light is on so uh, there's always this uh just very mundane thing because when you don't have the light early in the morning. It's very hard to get ready. Like say I was heading to Kiev for a very important meeting. Uh, it was a press conference at the office of the president of Ukraine. And I forgot my glasses because it was so dark that I thought that I didn't see anything just because it was dark. But, and then when I arrived to the train and then in Kiev, I had to walk around without seeing. I, I don't know how to find the office of the president because I couldn't see my way there. So little things like this are probably the hardest when they continue days on. And of course, um, they are way more dramatic and tragic um, details of everyday life, uh, because say if you are in Kherson, and I spend a lot of time in Kherson and Mykolaiv, um, you hear um, explosions almost every few minutes. Uh, sometimes they just don't stop and people get used to it. So you would be having this surreal conversation in a cafe downtown where people are talking about I don't know, their dogs or uh, driving to Odessa to see their grandchildren. And in the background, you hear the explosions and you know that somebody is being killed while it's happening, but people get used to it. And that that's really eerie. And then of course, coming back to the subject of our discussion, you see as a journalist, I see a lot of destroyed villages, towns, cities um and that is everywhere south and east wherever russians came close you see it say in uh the kherson oblast you can drive for miles and all you see around is this um sci-fi apocalyptic movie uh, and people still live there. Like, for instance, there's this Passat Pakrovsky um, village close to Kherson. And uh, you can't step off the road because everything is mined. And it's very hard to demine. Uh, it will take, uh, supposedly, according to the prime minister, Denis Shmigal, about 10 years to demine it. And Ukraine might be the most mined country in the world. 40% approximately of its territory is being mined, was mined by the Russians. 
and uh, then you, you follow the road and you see people uh, climbing from underneath this rubble because they stayed in, in their village and they have no running water, they have no heat, they have no electricity, no connection. It, they didn't have it for months. And you just wonder how is it possible for human beings and animals, there are a lot of stray dogs and cats to live there. There's no food. Or uh, if you go to Saltovka in Kharkov, that just a straight horror movie because there, there are ruined walls you see inside of the apartments. I think everybody by now have seen this carpets or pianos that somehow mysteriously stay in there. It looks like a theater setting when you look in and you don't see it. And then of course there's Donbass and East where things are happening right now. So you arrive to the village and it just was hit by Russian missiles. So the earth is on fire and you see dead animals and sometimes dead people and the, the house that is still smoking. Uh, and that, that's how Ukraine lives these days. Thanks Serena uh, for that. Uh just giving us a little bit of context. Um, Dennis, we'll move to you uh, next as Serena describes and as the uh, video shows, uh, of course, the destruction of homes and property is immense and a major component of a reconstruction effort will be uh, rebuilding these homes and getting Ukrainians back into their homes or compensating them for homes that have been destroyed. Um, last October, you published a report, uh, a needs assessment on the most urgent needs of the Ukrainian government and its citizens in order to protect Ukrainian property rights and facilitate this reconstruction. Can you provide a little bit of background on that report? And the second part of the question to you is, in your view, what progress has the government made since last fall and what challenges remain? Thank you, Yulia. Um, uh, thank you, Zarina, for uh, sharing your experience back in Ukraine. Um, it's really hard to follow your presentation because I live, I'm originally from Mykolaiv city, which is also in the south. And currently I'm working with a community of displaced people here in the UK. Um, so that brings a lot of emotions uh, after watching the video. But back to uh, Yulia's question. Uh, I, I was involved in uh, the need assessment in the area of protection of uh, housing and land property rights. And this is area of my expertise for many years. And what we know that any project, uh, infrastructure development, housing, agricultural development project has to deal with rights of those people who possess this property. And uh, what we are facing now is unprecedented scale of reconstruction work that Ukrainian uh, Ukrainian people have already started. Uh, but uh, as a part of the need assessment, uh, what we have uh, uh, documented, what we have uh, shown to uh, the audience is that we have a huge disconnect between the ruined capacity of the government institutions in the war affected areas and the need for protection of this land and, and, and housing property rights. Uh, so, um, and, and uh, the scale of the pro uh, problem uh, is related to three things. Uh, the uh, lack of capacity or scale of problems before the war. Uh, the Ukraine was going through the reforms before the war and uh, even before the war we had only about 40% of property rights being properly registered uh, in the electronic registry of property rights. Second, the sheer scale of the damages and lost rights. And third is the destroyed capacity, both physical capacity, but also because many people who work for various uh, institutions, notaries, uh, officers of various government services, uh, they have moved out of uh, the country or become internally displaced people themselves. So uh, all these three components uh, create a problem uh, or difficulty in starting the reconstruction process. So uh, a set of recommendations that we have developed uh, as a part of uh, the 
uh, need assessment back in August, September of 2022 was related to uh, establishing the legal framework for how people can uh, reestablish reclaim their property right if they lose all their documents or if they're uh, displaced and detached from the property. Uh, uh, and also uh, we have highlighted the needs for primary attention to rebuilding the uh, government services in uh, the deoccupied territories. Uh, in terms of the progress that was uh, made since the assessment uh, back in September, uh, I would like to highlight that uh, we have uh, restarted discussion of the key piece of legislation, uh, the uh, law on uh, the compensation of losses uh, for land uh, and, uh, and housing, uh, which focuses primarily uh, on the uh, residential housing units. And there were several innovations that were proposed in this law uh, so that people can uh, receive comp uh, compensation faster. Uh, several issues that we have identified earlier were addressed in the revised uh, proposal. However, not all of them. Some of the key issues uh, related to large scale compensation uh, or uh, portfolio uh, compensation of rights uh, related to other properties than housing units. Uh, and, uh, related to procedures of out court uh, resolution of disputes are yet not addressed. And that's something that uh, need to be uh, yet uh, developed with the legislation. Uh, but also uh, uh, we have mentioned previously, and now we can see it with the recent surveys, uh, that there is a huge need in supporting individuals who lost their uh, property uh, or have their property damaged, particularly because these people are uh, moved uh, away from the area where they have their property. Um, the recent uh, survey that was just published a few days ago uh, by a uh, rating group shows that uh, more than 10% of property uh, all uh, around Ukraine uh, is destroyed and, and damaged. However, uh, only about uh, 30% of people have actually uh, took any ste uh, steps to claim uh, the reimbursement or claim support in restitution of their property rights. So if this issue is not addressed urgently, if uh, we do not uh, support these individuals on how they can claim their existing rights, this problem may slow down the reconstruction process. And finally, and, and I think that would be a nice transition to what Michael uh, is going to present, we start seeing several very uh, powerful pilot projects all around the country uh, of how local governments and international institutions start working together uh, on uh, developing and starting implementing the uh, reconstruction pl uh, plans for uh, some uh, destroyed cities. I, I just have uh, uh, attended a meeting uh, today uh, with the groups that are working on reconstruction of Kharkiv and Mykolaiv, where pretty much the same issues that uh, Michael is going to talk about are discussed, but with application to large cities and some of the uh, most destroyed people. So I, I, I would probably pass the floor to Yulia and Michael to talk about the details of this process. Thanks so much, Dennis. And uh, thank you for mentioning that survey. Uh, we can send it around to the audience after this um, webinar, as well as really highlighting the importance of getting the word out to displaced people about what they can be and should be doing now to make sure that they're able to reclaim their property uh, once this conflict ends or receive compensation. So with that, I'd like to pass it to um, Michael. Michael, you have been in Kiev since uh, August. Tell us a little bit about what you are seeing in terms of the largest needs for um, reconstruction in Ukraine and what is the Peace Coalition doing about it? Sure. Um, well, thanks. Um, thanks, Yulia. Well, first, I want to thank Zarina and Denny for Dennis for doing such a great job setting me up. I hardly have anything to talk about, which is something new for me. Um, Yulia, Tim, Peter, thanks for and New America. Thanks for hosting such a great event. And thank you, everybody out there for attending. Um, 
So as, as Yulia mentioned, I've been in, in Kyiv now for six months, for almost seven months since the early, since early August. And, um, you know, as Zarina and Denny, Dennis have already pointed out, uh, you know, rebuilding, the rebuilding of Ukraine is going to be a long and complicated process. And that's to kind of put it mildly, right? But that doesn't mean that there aren't ways to make the process shorter and simpler, right? Um, as you mentioned, Yulia, it's going to be dreadfully expensive to rebuild Ukraine. I mean, I've seen estimates anywhere from $349 billion by the World Bank to $1.1 trillion from the uh, European Investment Bank. So, you know, I mean, those are big numbers, right? Um, you know, but that doesn't mean that Western taxpayers and supporters of Ukraine are going to need to fill the bill, Okay. Um, so if I was to kind of qualify, what is the biggest problem right now in terms of rebuilding Ukraine on the ground in Ukraine, I would say it's a lack of belief that it's actually going to happen. Um, you know, there has been an unbelievable outpouring of support from the West in terms of military aid and, and humanitarian aid and things like this for the population and, you know, people being displaced and taken into homes and, in Poland and across Europe and the UK and in Canada and everywhere else around the world. Um, but there hasn't been as much attention focused on the idea of compensation, restitution and rebuilding. Um, you know, and, and this is, so what this is leading to is kind of a lack of belief. I, and, and this is something that is, you know, I, I would say primarily focused on the kind of resident population of Ukraine. So I, it was funny, I, not funny, but I mean, I noticed in, in one of the videos that Zarina played, she visited Borjanka. And I visited in August, uh, my colleagues and I visited the same building that she showed. It's one of these, and it's, it's kind of a sadly a common site, but it's one of these large Soviet blocks where there's literally two pieces of the building left and the middle of it was, was bombed right out of it. A Russian aircraft dropped a bomb right in the middle of this civilian apartment building. You know, 350 people live in the building, 30 people die in the basement. And this happened in March of last year. And so we visited in August. So this was about six months after the building was, was literally rendered uninhabitable and nothing had changed. The building hadn't even been torn down. The site hadn't even been touched. Um, some of the residents, you know, one of the residents we talked to, Alexander, He's kind of become a bit of a, an activist in Borjanka, and he's trying to advocate for, you know, getting the building at least torn down so they could start reconstruction. Nothing. Um, some of the residents in this time, it was 35 degrees Celsius outside, and they were living in a temporary shelter. Uh, these box shelters that were built in the football stadium in Borjanka, it was too hot to be in the structure in the summer, and it was going to be uninsulated in the winter. And we are now a year almost later, Yulia, and nothing has happened at this building in Borjank. Okay. Um, so, you know, this, there's this lack of belief amongst the people, and there are reasons for it, most notably the fact that the government of Ukraine doesn't have the money to start a large-scale reconstruction process. Okay. And this is something that we're going to address, the, the senator and, um, and the ambassador and, and Peter are going to address in the next uh, section but you know the because of the i guess the peculiarities or vague vagarities or whatever of international law when you set out a compensation program for the people of ukraine whose houses have been damaged or destroyed or, or you know as part of this process the technicality is they're filing claims against the government of ukraine and then it's a, incumbent upon the government of ukraine to put those claims together and take them and file them against the International Criminal Court. So, you know, there's a there's a there's a challenge in trying to reconcile giving people hope that their homes are going to be rebuilt and giving them false hope because they don't have the money to actually start the process. So this is basically ground everything to a bit of a halt when it comes to the rebuilding process. And where you do see, you know, kind of areas of light in across the country are in projects um, like the, the one that Dennis was talking about in Mikolaev, 
where these are externally funded initiatives to take on the rebuilding of a particular area, a particular place. And so what we kind of did is, is, you know, we didn't want to take on a huge project, but we realized there's so many different aspects of this challenge. You know, Yulia, you need to, we need to get people back to Ukraine as soon as possible, okay, from their wherever they're internally displaced or externally displaced. And in order to do that, we need to, there needs to be a more efficient um, and say, um, let's just say efficient uh, process for claiming for damages. Okay. And then once you've got a lot of claims filed, you need to have the money to pay for those claims. And when you have the money to pay for those claims, you have to make sure that it gets deployed inside the country in a way where you get as much as a, as transparent and as efficient use of that money. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I think everybody here probably will have seen there was a big uh, kind of um, anti-corruption, uh, you know, kind of operation happened in Ukraine, because it is a challenge in a lot of these former Soviet bloc republics, is, is internal levels of corruption and bureaucracy that just grind processes to a halt. So you have to think about a way that okay, if we get the money and we get it quickly and we get the people back in quickly, can we deploy it quickly? So there's just a whole bunch of problems. And, um, you know, so what we did is we put together a pilot project to address all of these problems. We're going to rebuild two villages outside of Kiev, places that Zarina mentioned nobody's heard of. One's called Andrivka and one is called Kozarovici. They're both within the Kiev Oblast. You can drive there to both of them in about 30 minutes. And the goal is to test the whole thing. Let's do efficient claims. Let's get the money in. Let's deploy it. Let's build new villages, da 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 da, and prove on a process that can hopefully scale across the country. And it's just to put some practical application to a lot of the policy and, and good work that people like Dennis and Zarina and, and you know the senator and the ambassador and you and Tim and everybody do on a daily basis. So that's basically it in a nutshell. Thanks, Michael. Um, and uh, you, you know. I'll turn it back over to Zarina and Dennis. Uh, Dennis began to speak about, and then Michael elaborated on uh, these pilot efforts to, uh, you know, to borrow the term, build back better, to um, build uh, the country back uh, better socially, economically, politically, uh, using innovative tools. And I'm curious, Zarina and Dennis, um, what would this look like, and what are the most promising um, approaches that you have uh, seen thus far? Oh, you're on mute, Zarina. Uh, I will jump in and uh, I don't know if we're supposed to have just a uh, flowing, straightforward discussion or we can argue a little bit because uh, from everything I've seen, I, I, I have slightly disagree about the disbelief because wherever I go, I see Ukrainians just starting to build back. You know, they are still being bombed and I see them, I hear the sound of construction and I've seen a lot of uh, buildings being restored all around the country and that includes Mikolaev, by the way, they're going really, really fast there, Dennis. And on Borodyanka, I spoke to a lot of locals and they had, this is just how complex it is. There were a bunch of people and there were, uh, at the time when I was there, there were some posters outside uh, on the balconies that survived saying that we want to stay. We don't want to have this uh, building being completely demolished. We want them to kind of like build in between these two things, which is kind of like to layman, it seems absurd, but this, this is their homes. I went inside with a woman who grew up in the apartment on the sixth floor, and it's emotional for her. She, de she doesn't want this building to be demolished. So it's not that straightforward, it's psychological. And lastly, I don't know if I agree that right now the goal number one is to get uh, people who fled to Europe to come back. Like, come on, just today uh, when Putin was making his quote unquote speech, mumbling something uh, about, you know, how the West started the war, whatever, they've uh, hit uh, her son with 20 grads killing six people. And a friend of mine is there right now. And he just sent me a picture. I was distracted because I got a picture of literally, and forgive me for being graphic, 
puddles of blood on her own pavement. So I disagree about the need for people to come back until we as the collective West help to close the sky over Ukraine. I personally don't want anybody to come back. I've seen too many lives uh, being destroyed. So that's, and again, we can debate. It's not, it's just my opinion. Um, I never stand, you know, say that that's the last and written in stone, but that's, that's what I think and feel. Um, as for the innovative uh, um, ways of restoring it, I had a very inspiring conversation with the mayor of Mykolaiv, uh, Mr. Sinkevich, uh, who is a very, very impressive mayor. I've, I've talked to a lot of mayors and uh, compared to what they do and everybody has something to offer. But Mr. Sinkevich's background is in um, high tech. So he's very excited about bringing in innovation. And last time I spoke to him three weeks ago, so for an interview, and you can watch the whole interview on the channel, I can share the link later. Uh, and he was talking about using DIA, which for those who don't know is a, a very unique uh, digital electronic database program uh, that pretty much covers every aspect of life in Ukraine. Uh, it, it's very advanced, like you can sit at home on your bed and do banking, get your passport, uh, get married, I hear. I haven't tried, but you know, there are all kinds of things available that for us sometimes borderline, you know, privacy, like they are aiming for an electronic passport which I know in many countries I know go uh, for, for many reasons. So um, uh, Mr. Sinkevich got together with the Minister of Digital Transformation, Mikhaila Fyodorov, who several months ago was telling me all about DIA, and it is very advanced. Uh, and they are going to use it in order to register the loss of property and have this electronic documents. And I'm not going to go into every detail because A, I don't know every detail, and B, it's better when you hear it from Mr. Sinkevich, which you can, it's in an interview, but it's out there. They also are using the GIS uh, system he was telling me about, and uh, it's, uh, for those who do not know, it's a GIS geographical information system uh, and they um, geographic information system. Uh, and supposedly, according to Mr. Sinkevich, they have the best one in the country. Uh, it was built before the war in 2000, well, before the full scale invasion. I don't think we have mentioned that yet, but I think we should, that the war started in 2014, which we have now uh, is a full scale invasion, which started about a year ago on the 24th of February of 2022, but the war was going on for almost nine years, three days short of nine years by now. So that uh, geographic information system was built in 2016 and it's a multi-layered system. Uh, and those layers would include pipelines, the land, the real estate. And now during the war with cooperation with the Kiev Economic School and Dennis, you might have heard about it. They have added a new layer for distractions. And so based on that, they make estimates for the amount of money needed for restoration of the destroyed objects of infrastructure, real estate, and they mark it on the map. And then they add ground and satellite Marxar images and also drone images. And they, I understand, have the help from the government of Denver, which sponsors some additional work. Uh, and so this way they um, were able to come up with an estimated preliminary sum of losses, which I believe is about nine uh, 900 million euros, uh, according to Mr. Sinkevich. Uh, so this, this is definitely innovative and one way of looking at it. And um, as for the source of money, uh, I was just talking um, to Mr. Anders Aslund, uh, who is the former senior uh, fellow on the Atlantic Council. And um, he was telling me that uh, the reasons for which the various ministries of justice and finance uh, and Western banks are reluctant to freeze or to use the Russian assets, the Russian central bank 
assets and the Russian oligarchs frozen assets, which amount to 19 billion in Switzerland only, um, are not satisfactory. But I also heard that Switzerland actually did freeze this money and is willing to uh, find the way and find the legislative uh, mechanism to transfer this money for the restoration and reconstruction of Ukraine. So this is the way to go. And also in the Atlantic Council uh, recently, about a month ago, or so there was an interesting article uh, by a Ukrainian businessman um, who's uh, in charge of some agricultural um, sector. I, I think he's a private businessman, though, uh, who was talking about establishing a financial corridor which will be kind of similar to this grain initiative where there was a, a grain corridor where with a special help and the way the loans would be built. Uh, and it's a very interesting article. I just recommend for those who are interested to, to look it up because it seems to be offering some good ways of doing it. Yeah, so let me follow up, Zarina. Uh, I, I agree with you on uh, several points, uh, particularly about refugees, and that's the advice that the Ukrainian government uh, was provided, and that's what we are trying to explain to refugees that, you know, it's better to stay in a safe place until it is safe to return. But what is important is that uh, many of these people, about 30%, that's what we see from the surveys, uh, about 30% of the refugees, internal and external, have no place to return. Right? And uh, until the... Recon uh, but the only reason why these people are actually coming back, many of them are coming back and then returning again to a safe place, is the questions about the property that they left behind. They worry about whether it is safe, uh, they are not sure how to claim uh, the damages when this reconstruction process is started. They all fear about losing their rights to their housing, to their land, and so on. And uh, again, referring to the survey, uh, about 2% uh, of uh, people have already started the reconstruction, not waiting uh, for the government, not waiting for the international aid. They're doing what they can do. They patch the windows, they patch the roofs, they, you know, they clean the, 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 the yards. The life is going, uh, going on in the areas that uh, are on the front line, no matter what. Um, regarding DIA, one point that I would like to mention, uh, DIA was one of the first applications, uh, the first tools that people can use to claim the damages and, uh, and, and lost property. Within a few days after the war started, this application was upgraded uh, and enabled people to actually document uh, the, the damages and upload some of the uh, photo evidence uh, of, of the uh, of the uh, uh, destruction and uh, most of this information is now transferred to the state registry of damages. Um, final point is that with uh, the pilot projects uh, similar to Michael's and uh, several other, one thing that becomes clear, uh, we would need to have a very different approach to the rebuilding of areas far away from the front line with you know single buildings or pieces of uh, infra uh, infrastructure being destroyed and uh, cities like Bakhmut, like Lysychansk uh, and there are unfortunately many other places like that where you know close to 90 percent of all structures are destroyed where, where people have lost everything which places which are not livable even though there are people who stay in these cities so um, I, I, I think what we, we, we see now, there are ideas and solutions to these places that have smaller scale uh, destruction, but we yet have to rethink how to deal with the places that are unlivable and we don't know when um, people will be able to return to any sort of a normal life in these places. 
Yeah, I, I agree. And I've seen those places. I, I've seen the cities, like I mentioned before, that they were completely burned out and nothing is left. But one thing I uh, forgot to mention also with Dia, and this is something in regards of what you were saying, Michael, is um, the corruption issue. Uh, Mr. Simkevich told me, I wasn't convinced, but that's what he told me, that Dia will help to handle this corruption issue because computers don't take bribes, which is true. But then computers are run by people. But they believe, Mr. Ferdorf and Mr. Sinkevich, and they know better than I do, uh, I, I think uh, that this will help uh, to bring some objectivity to the uh, project. Thanks, Dennis and Zarina. Uh, we will, uh, I will ask one more question and then we'll uh, move on to a little bit of audience Q&A. Um, to those in the audience, please feel free to drop uh, any questions that you have. Um, uh, and I'm already seeing a few being populated. So this question, this last question is to um, all three panelists. Uh, we've spent a lot of time talking about destroyed homes and property, but of course, a major issue is uh, civilian infrastructure. And Zarina, as you alluded to in your opening remarks, just uh, basic, the provision of basic necessities. So in your view, what's needed to get Ukraine's civilian infrastructure back up and running? Um, I'll take a I'll take a first shot at that one, Yuli, if you don't mind. Um, you know, the at the end of the day, right, it was the, the, the damage and destruction in a lot of the villages and and towns and cities around Ukraine was was in certain respects, uh, you know, intentional and also indiscriminate. Right. I mean, artillery will hit one building and another and another. And and so when you're talking about rebuilding anything, a neighborhood, a city, a village, it's not just the houses that people live in. It's the schools that their children go to. It's the clinics that they have to go to to see a doctor. It's the local administration buildings that they need to go to to you know get their permits or do whatever they do. It's the small businesses that employ them. You know, so Andrivka and Gozarovici have some, uh, you know, some kind of agricultural based businesses. There was a furniture manufacturer in Gozarovici where the owner was just taken away by the Russians. And so, you know, there's a I think that if we're going to rebuild these places any everywhere in Ukraine, it has to be a, from a holistic view of how do you plan, you know, take the opportunity to not just put new roofs on and put nails and windows and things but to replan these villages as part of a greater kind of a regional effort to consolidate things like medical services and education and health care and employment and all of these things in a better way than they were before. Just, you know, we've got an opportunity to do it. Let's think about it a second. Let's plan it. Let's plan it so that the people can come back, have a roof over their head, a school for their kids to go to and a job and a store for them to buy their groceries at. Yeah, I would second uh, Michael, and that's exactly what uh, we can and we should start doing yesterday, in fact, because the question is not just rebuild, but uh, uh, to rebuild better, more efficient. We can talk about the reconstruction of isolated buildings, but also uh, using the modern technologies, using better isolation, uh, making the houses uh, more uh, energy efficient and self-sufficient to the extent but with the largest city the starting point is really this holistic approach that michael is talking about uh, starting with the master plan talking about rebuilding the cities that are uh, more attractive to people which are more ecological for people who live there with better transportation with uh, better and more accessible green spaces and so on and so forth. So I think uh, currently at this stage of development, globally we have you know a lot of knowledge and skills developed for for urban planning, and all these skills are currently necessary to start working with small villages like near Kiev or larger cities like Kharkiv and Mykolaiv. But the starting point is pretty much the same. We start developing these master plans that would make the cities better, more attractive, but also will preserve the heritage of those cities that make those cities unique and attractive 
to their citizens. And uh, I completely agree with the previous speakers. And uh, I want to add that this discussion wouldn't be complete if we didn't look, uh, and you said it, Dennis, uh, the key word, ecological, the whole environment. We can't take just uh, reconstruction and forget about the you know, nature around it. And I am not even talking, we have mentioned that, restoring the energy infrastructure, water pipelines, so gas pipelines, which are being hit deliberately by the Russians and destroyed. Like in many cities, they've done it because that's their policy of terror. They want people to be demoralized and surrender because of difficult living conditions. There's even a, a word for it now, holodomor, as opposed to uh, holodomor, as opposed to golodomor, which it is, is a, I understand, hard to catch uh, for known um, Ukrainian speaker. But there is a, a death by uh, hunger, which of course was engineered by Stalin. And now there's death by cold, which is an attempt of being engineered by Putin. So uh, just like in Odessa, it was like almost unlivable where I was staying. Um, and of course, in other areas, it's even harder. But also there is a, an issue of the whole environment. And we're talking about uh, fires uh, close to Chernobyl uh, or Zaporizhia, nuclear power uh, uh, plant, plants where the nuclear waste are being stored. So that already presents an issue. Uh, the rivers uh, that uh, spillage are happening on a big scale, like in Mykolaiv, the oil depot was hit and the oil covered the river with a thin film. And then a lot of fish died uh, because they didn't have enough oxygen. Or in the Black Sea, there were uh, thousands of uh, dead dolphins cast upon the sea. And that's also because of the mines, because of the acoustic interferences from the Russian submarines and radars, and also because of the pollution. So I can go on, as you can tell, forever, but it's air, it's water, uh, it's the um, soil that is heavily mined, as I have mentioned. So we need to think about it holistically, as everybody here is bringing up. Just adding a small point to what Zarina is saying, just think about the amount of the uh, rubbish or uh, the, the, the debris from uh, all these destroyed uh, buildings. We have to develop ways to reprocess it or uh, safely remove it uh, from, uh, from the cities so that people can start rebuilding. Absolutely. You know, I did a story at the Kherson dump, city dump. I'm not going to go into that, but it's an issue. So I'll ask one last question again to all three uh, panelists, uh, just a um, uh, quick uh, last question from the audience, and then uh, we will move on to the fireside chat. Um, and the question is, uh, uh, you all have mentioned the large numbers of displaced persons, either inside or outside the, the country. What should those people be doing now to ensure that when the time comes, they can come home and they can get back into their homes and prove that those homes are in fact theirs or that they're eligible for compensation for any homes that have been destroyed? Um, if I could jump in first on that one, um, I, I'm going to say it's, it's, I'm going to say it's kind of simple, but, and, and something that maybe a lot of people aren't is, isn't in their mind is, is gather all, all and any evidence you have. You need to gather any evidence you have. If you've got pictures on your phone, don't delete them to clear up space to take pictures of where you are. Make sure that any picture you have of you and your family and anybody who's in your house, you keep all of that. If you've got online bill payments, keep all of that. If you've got documents, passports, driver's licenses, land titles, take pictures of them, store them. Keep any evidence that you have of your existence in Ukraine, especially as it relates to your personal and your family identity and your personal and your family um, location, like where you lived. Get all of that together and be ready to submit it, but get as much of it as you can. If I may follow up, uh, I think the key point is not to wait, uh, wait until it is safe to return. Uh, there are actions that 
must be taken now and yesterday. First step, as Michael said, to make sure that you have these records, but also there is an online process how people can check for whether the existing rights are properly registered. And if not, to start the registration process, no matter whether your property is uh, damaged or not, better not, but uh, to make sure that uh, your rights are properly documented and secured by government. That's the first process, uh, the first uh, point in this process. Later on, when the property is destroyed, when the documents are lost, it becomes way more difficult to, to uh, restore the, the property rights. Thank you, Dennis and Michael. Uh, Zarina, uh, any last words from you either on this question or just any wrap up, uh, parting well, words? Uh, I'm not in a position, I, I, I don't handle this aspect. I, I report, I did see people reporting what they have lost. Um, and some of them just go to the police station, like in Kherson, I've seen people doing that and actually was helping with that. But I don't have any practical advice on that. My major thing is what Dennis said, just, I guess, hard as it is, perhaps it's better to wait out. I, I know victory is coming. I know it's coming soon. Uh, but it is probably safer, especially if you have children right now it is uh, deceptive safeness uh, safety even in Kiev where it seems very very normal but I, I wouldn't especially if you have people dependent on you um, I, I would think about it and check about it before returning back sad as it is to say that uh, and uh, I just want to thank everybody to have an interest in that because of course as a person who sees this destruction on a daily basis. I'm very invested in seeing some positive changes and I wanna keep this positive as this discussion as positive as it has been. There are solutions. Uh, there are people who want to help. Uh, there are very capable mayors I've been talking to all over Ukraine and not just mayors, but the governments. And I'm very, very inspired by Ukrainian people and by everyday life i i see people you know one that's what i'll finish with my favorite pictures that i took in all my almost year in the war torn ukraine is the picture of a lady who is gardening uh with the background of the black sky because the oil depot was just being blown you know there's big explosion and she's gardening and taking care of her property. And that's what I've been seeing everywhere. I just didn't take as good pictures as this came out. And, and that gives me hope. I know that Ukraine will be restored. I just see it in people. And that, that will be my closing statement for that. Thank you. Thank you, Zarina. What a wonderful way to close this panel. I would like to thank our panelists, Zarina, Dennis, Michael, and turn it over uh, and introduce uh, my um, colleague, Peter Bergen, uh, who will uh, take us through the fireside chat. Uh, Peter uh, is a man who needs no introduction, but I will briefly introduce him anyway. Peter is uh, a vice president at New America, uh, where he is the vice president for global studies and fellows. He's also CNN's national security analyst and a professor of practice at Arizona State University, where he co-directs a center on the future of war. Uh, Peter is the author and editor of 10 books, three of which were New York Times bestsellers. Um, I can go on. Peter, I will turn it over to you to kick us off for the fireside chat. Thank you, Julia. Um, and <clears throat> thank you, everybody um, on the previous panel. Uh, we all learned a lot. So um, I'm going to introduce our two uh, next panelists. Uh, both of whom are uh, real experts on the issue at hand. The first is Senator Ratna Omidvar from Canada, uh, who uh, was uh, appointed to the Senate in, in Canada as an independent senator representing Ontario in 2016. She's the chair of the Standing Senate Committee on Social Affairs, Science and Technology, 
She served as a deputy chair of the Special Senate Committee on the Charitable Sector, and she's the vice president of the Canada-Germany Parliamentary Group. Um, she moved to Canada from Iran in 1981 and is a well-known internationally recognized voice on diversity, migration, and inclusion. And our other panelist is Ambassador David Sheffer, who is a colleague of mine at Arizona State University, um, but he was the first uh, ambassador, uh, U.S. ambassador for war crimes in the Clinton administration. Uh, he's been involved in all sorts of war crimes tribunals, including the Special Court for Sierra Leone, uh, the Khmer Rouge uh, Tribunal. Uh, he negotiated the creation of the International Criminal Tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda. Um, and he has written books on this subject, um, and he's presently a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. So um, let me start with you, uh, Ambassador Sheffer, just to kind of give us a, a broad overview of the question of, um, I mean, you know better than everybody that um, there have been relatively few successful prosecutions at the International Criminal Court. Even in the case of Bosnia, there were 91 successful prosecutions, despite all the you know, many, many, many thousands of war crimes that were committed, which is not to say that the enterprise wasn't worth doing, obviously. Uh, but it's um, how do you get funds for reconstruction? How has it happened in the past? How have funds been recovered? Have there been successful examples of restitution uh, for these kinds of crimes that go beyond simply a, a guilty conviction in a court? Thank you so much, Peter. It's a great pleasure to be uh, with the Senator and you on this uh, panel. Well, first, I, I think it should be understood that there is a paucity, a lack of actually acquiring reparations as a result of criminal prosecutions. Even those in leadership circles who have been the primary objects of prosecution of the war crimes tribunals for the last 30 years, uh, even if they have independent wealth uh, squirreled away somewhere, very rarely is the tribunal in a position to actually identify that wealth and, and seize it. In fact, it's been almost impossible to do so. There's been a long struggle, I think, at the International Criminal Court to explore how to ramp up their ability to deal with assets of suspects and, and defendants, particularly, um, in terms of how to identify them, where to track them down, and try to, to um, seize them for the purpose of, of uh, part of the sentencing of the individual, if the individual is convicted. So there's a real lack there. Um, I think the most successful process was actually the UN Compensation Commission that was set up after Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait um, back in 1990. And that process was very much aimed at seizing uh, or having control of, um, of Iraqi assets and of Iraqi oil wealth in order to pay claims that Kuwait had against uh, Iraq. So that was, a, that was not a criminal court uh, procedure that was rather a negotiated political process through, uh, but mandated by the UN Security Council, which of course helps. Uh, and it was fairly successful in actually acquiring the necessary funds from Iraq to rebuild uh, Kuwait. Ukraine is on a scale far in excess of Kuwait. I mean, uh, the destruction in Ukraine is is um, unprecedented, uh, essentially, in terms of property destruction, as well as the claims that families of those who have been killed, civilians who have been killed, would have. So um, I, I do think that ultimately, we need to be looking at a process which provides the necessary financing without necessarily requiring criminal convictions in a criminal court against individuals, but also may not necessarily require um, uh, judgments from, shall we say, the International Court of Justice against Russia as a state for responsibility for reparations. 
those are ideal outcomes. And if we get them, that's tremendous because that undergirds national uh, uh, procedures to freeze assets, apply them uh, in the interest of victims and the, the restoration of Ukraine. Those kinds of convictions or judgments are tremendous foundational stones legally for that process. But we also have to be looking at options that may not uh, necessarily have the benefit of criminal convictions or of state judgments and how we can ensure that some of these funds can, can actually ultimately, or that funding can actually be raised. And I know that um, uh, uh, the Senator, you know, has, has, will want to speak to how Canada has been at the forefront of legislating under law, the, the seizure of assets so that ultimately through judicial action, those assets can be made available without there necessarily being a finding of criminal culpability or of state responsibility. Well, Senator, that, you've been instrumental in moving forward this legislation that the ambassador referred to, and part of it is seizing the assets of uh, uh, Roman Abramovich, who are, many people may know used to own the Chelsea Football Club before the invasion of Ukraine. Uh, but a uh, very well-known figure in the UK. Um, so tell us about how that came about um, and what the intention is here, uh, what, what your larger intention is here also in terms of providing some kind of roadmap for other countries to do this kind of thing. Thank you, Peter. And uh, I can't but help agree with the caution that uh, uh, Ambassador Sheffer has raised uh, around uh, the seizing uh, of assets. My proposal, which was actually, I began to think about it in 2017 and tabled it in the Senate in 2019, way before Ukraine was on the horizon, linked my concern around corruption and what I saw as its inevitable uh, uh, linkages with misgovernance and displacement. Um, so, uh, you know, I know, uh, and, and Canada has uh, a list of sanctioned uh, assets, um, and we have the names of those who are sanctioned, but we, but we don't know how much money uh, is is in in the institutions where their assets are held. So I proposed a bill whereby Canada would be able to hold uh, corrupt foreign officials to account. Uh, Based on the fact that they have uh, that they are uh, guilty of uh, or they have committed human rights abuses and created mass force displacement to account for their misdeeds, but also to provide some restitution to the victims of of their crimes. Um, Frozen money, and, and lots of jurisdictions have frozen money through Magnitsky sanctions and others, but I will submit to you that frozen money is dead money. It is no good to the victims. And this was a lever that I used to sort of uh, free up those assets and put them to use where they are most needed. My bill in Canada had cross-party support, but it was a private bill. It was not supported by the government. So its passage uh, to approval would have been very long and rather rather uh, complicated. But then in 2021, of course, we all know, uh, uh, 2022, sorry, uh, Russia invaded Ukraine and the government of Canada adopted this bill as one of the many, many measures that Canada was going to provide to help Ukraine. And I want to uh, state once again, how how uh, how very supportive Canadians are of uh, helping the Ukrainian people uh, regain their land and their freedom. Um, so the invasion of Ukraine changed everything. Um, the bill that I I pro that I proposed and the government has adopted does not go through criminal court. Uh, does not require a criminal conviction in a criminal court. It is a it is a uniquely political tool in a way because it is the government of Canada and in other cases it will be other governments who decide on on the basis of of evidence that they have uh, that they have access to on petitions made by by civil society organizations that the assets of a certain individual or a certain state entity uh, because that is possible under our law 
can be uh, uh, seized and repurposed to help the victims. Um, the government, our government, is silent on how they will actually repurpose with what accountability, with transparency. There are some judicial process built in, but not to the extent that I had provided for in my bill. So I look forward to how the government of Canada is going to action the repurposing of Roman Abramovich's uh, um, assets. $26 million is, is not a lot of money, but it can make for um, an, an important case study of how to do it and to do it right. The government of Canada, and I recognize that Canada is, is not the place where most of this uh, corrupt money is parked. Most of it is parked in the UK, in the EU, and possibly the US. Uh, and, and Canada's motivation is to, is to lead as a middle power, take some risk where others may not be able to take so that others follow our footsteps. And already we are seeing uh, interest in the idea in the UK, which is interested in the state-held as assets of uh, Russia in the EU, which uh, which is discussing a version of this uh, intervention at the EU parliamentary level. And the US has already passed a law, perhaps uh, Ambassador Sheffer can, can enlighten us about this. And of course, in 2016, the Swiss passed a law. There is history to this. The Swiss have a very similar law. They have already repurposed billions of dollars of assets. Um, and I can provide some examples if if the time permits. Thank you. So Ambassador, what, what has the US done that's, that's new on this issue? Yes, the US um, <clears throat> at the end of uh, the last year, the Senate uh, uh, adopted a law that does open up the window for, for freezing uh, assets ultimately for use in uh, reparative rebuilding initiatives uh, in Ukraine. And that was part of the you know, large appropriations bill that was finally adopted in the early part of January. But um, we need to see actually, just as, as Senator Omidvar mentioned with respect to Canada, there's a lot of logistical and procedural issues that swirl around this law as to how far it can be taken um, by, for example, the Justice Department to actually not only block those assets, but allocate them towards specific objectives and what the courts will actually require before that can be accomplished. I think it's tremendously strengthening that there's now a federal law on the books because that's a great gateway in the courts to actually make this happen. In the absence of it, there were a host of legal issues that would dissuade one from seeking to do that in the United States in part because, um, I mean, there are so many arguments, but one of them would be, would you have to prove in the court that the United States is at war with Russia over Ukraine, because that would open up a gateway, uh, clearly, for the use of, of frozen assets. The United States, I don't think, would want to go into the courtroom and literally claim that they are at war with Russia. So this law provides a much better foundation uh, to, to work these arguments uh, in the courtroom. We don't have any test case yet. Um, but the, the fact that the, the law is on the books, I think very much inspired by the fact that our neighbors in Canada under the senator's leadership did adopt such a law, very much influenced by that precedent, um, is, is good news uh, in the United States. Ambassador, you've uh, advocated for the use of social bonds to address war crimes. Can you tell the audience a bit about what those bonds are and how they might be applied to the right. Russian case in Ukraine? Social bonds, uh, to put it most simply, are bonds which seek to achieve a social purpose as opposed to a commercial profit-making purpose, which so many bonds do seek to do. But in this case, this social bond um, is somewhat similar to our, all our, our familiar notion of a municipal bond. You put a municipal bond out in order to build the sewer system in your community. It's going to require a lot of money up front. And so you do that. But then the government, the local government, pledges to repay that bond, the principal and interest, 
uh, for those who invest in the bond. So it's a governmental liability, so to speak. But a social bond um, is a much uh, broader concept whereby um, you, you look at a particular social priority, whether it be the environment, which is where some social bonds, we call them green bonds at the time, and still do, you know, started to emerge around 2010, et cetera, um, to look at a particular problem. And when the, pan when the COVID-19 pandemic uh, occurred, there was need for an enormous amount of, of funds uh, to, to cover the contingencies and the realities of the COVID crisis. And it jump-started the social bond market, particularly in Europe, and even in Asia uh, as well with the, uh, with the Asian banks. So that social bond is grounded on the fact that the investors in the bond believe in the social purpose. And they are prepared to put their money up front uh, provided one and possibly two things happen. One, that there's a good sovereign guarantee of the bond so that they know that 10, 20, 25 years from now, they will get their principal back. That's important. Uh, social investors are, are investors, private investors who believe in the social purpose. They're ready to commit to the social purpose of the bond. But in addition to that, they might sometimes want uh, an additional incentive um, or not incentive, but they may accept an additional requirement in the social bond, uh, which again is tied to the social objective, which is, take a slightly lower interest rate on your bond and we will use the differential um, for the good of the social purpose. Um, take the lower interest rate and ultimately you will still get your principal back, but the total amount of interest that you get back on the bond may be less than what would actually be earned on a typical conventional commercial bond. But because you have a conscience, you have a social conscience, you as an investor are prepared to have a slight discount on your profit uh, in order to facilitate that. But let, let me just say the great objective here is, to, is for governments not to be burdened in a crisis situation with an enormous amount of money that has to be raised quickly and they simply cannot do it in their own national budgetary procedures and processes, it's not possible. So you go to the private market to raise that money, but the governments are involved and, and sometimes in a contingent liability basis to guarantee it. Um, and, and then we work out how that's actually paid out 10, 20, 25 years in the future. I think we'll also be talking, Peter, though, uh, about uh, since the guarantee would be a collateral, it might also be that these frozen assets ultimately could be uh, considered collateral as well for these bonds. Senator, what do you make of that proposal? Uh, I think um, we have to look at ways of bringing private money into this conversation. Absolutely. Uh, the rebuilding of Ukraine estimated at, at $1 trillion is, is not going to come from the tax coffers of a collective of, of nation states. I do think uh, inserting the social bond concept into a conversation about asset seizure and repurposing adds another layer of complexity. Both the conversations have layers of complexity. You know, on the asset seizure side, there's transparency, accountability, due process, the law, all of that. And on the social bond side, there's guarantees, payments, contingent liabilities. But I think in this case, two plus two may well make four. And I, I put that out for a couple of reasons. And I'm going to extend the conversation, not just generally to social bonds, but more particularly to social impact bonds, where the payout or the liquidation uh, or the payout to the investors is, 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 is contingent upon the delivery of a certain objective. It's easiest imagined in the, in the context of Ukraine, particularly with uh, reconstruction of buildings, schools, infrastructures, high, you know, grid infrastructure grids, et cetera, et cetera. And the, the investor gets paid at a certain point where there is enough proof 
that the project is either 75% completed or about to be completed. And then the government would, uh, would be called on to provide the investor and therefore, uh, you know, maybe liquidate the frozen assets. So I think there is a real possibility for a reason that I appreciate perhaps uh, more because I was part of crafting this law and that is the reason of accountability. No government will want to take frozen assets, seize them and repurpose them without providing accountability for the public good that they are providing to the victims. This is an incredibly sensitive point. Canada has already once repurposed assets uh, back to Libya at the request of the Libyan government. Muammar Gaddafi had billions of dollars of assets worth in Canada. We put, repurposed them in good faith and we don't know what happened to that money. We all know uh, that Libya is not exactly uh, the most stable of countries and that money could have been used. So, you know, I think this is an opportunity of bringing two different conversations together of uh, and creating a movement uh, possibly predicated in, in Canada because we're closest out of the gate of, um, based on the $26 million of Roman Abramovich and tying that money to a social impact bond where the $26 million is used by the government to back its contingent liability for the reconstruction of Ukraine. I'm thinking about it in a very practical, pragmatic sense. Proof so of using, concept will be would be necessary here. So potentially using seized funds as a collateral for these social yes. bonds. Yes. So the Libya example is interesting. So Gaddafi had billions of dollars in Canada, which Canada seized and then repurposed, but then the money disappeared or what, what happened? We froze the money. Yeah. Uh, we didn't seize it. Uh, okay. On the request of the new Libyan government, it's their money, we released it back without any conditions. <laughs> and yeah. at the same time, you know, there are calls on Canada as part of the part of the world order to help Ukraine, to help the Ukrainian people, to help the Libyan refugees. And we ask ourselves, what happened to that money? You know, in an interesting way, Peter, I might yeah. just add, um, uh, Senator Omidvar has inspired me to leap to the following statement, which <laughs> is that uh, at the end of the day, one, if if the if the frozen assets can be repurposed, and that's the challenge, of course, if they can be repurposed so that it is those funds which are actually allocated towards payment of the, the reconstruction requirements, um, then the the sole investor, is Abramovich. He becomes the social investor <laughs> against his will, but we can honor him as the social investor in the use of his funds through the procedure that the senator has uh, has opened up in Canada. I'm sure he'll feel very good about that. Um, so just a final question for both of you, because we're uh, coming up against time. Uh, you know, I don't know, you may have seen the New York Times just a few days ago. It was a, a big story. The, it was the world's largest construction site. Uh, it was the title of uh, the the piece, but essentially, you know, making the point that there is there are a lot of opportunities here that people are beginning to look at. Yeah. Um, so, what's needed from? I'll start with the senator from from governments, donors, nonprofits, private sector to help support um, the recovery, whenever that is. Well, I think we we need to think of a of a twenty twenty. 3 2024 2025 Marshall Plan call it what you may but that was that was the the initiative uh, where various nation states and private sector companies and civil societies put their heads together to rebuild Germany after the war and I think that's a model we need to consider uh, as we as we engage in these conversations about reparations to Ukraine and I I think uh, the other essential part of this is uh, is the official reparations from the state of Russia uh, to Ukraine for the mayhem and uh, devastation that it has caused. There is history. The world history tells us how 
uh, invading states are dealt with. Uh, the ambassador gave an example of Iraq. There are other examples in history. So a mixing and mingling of reparations from Russia, uh, plus uh, the investments of uh, nation states, private investors, and civil societies to rebuild Ukraine. We should begin to have that conversation right now. The question of reparations is an interesting one because, of course, the Treaty of Versailles imposed, mm. you know, very onerous reparations on the Germans, so much so that you could make a, at least a partial argument that, you know, it helped precipitate the rise of Hitler, etc. Um, so, you know, who decides what the scale of those reparations are and how do you do it in such a way, politically, Ambassador Schaeffer, that it doesn't sort of create another crisis down the road? And also, sort of relatedly, um, the cold question of Ukraine's entrance into the EU, presumably that would be very helpful uh, for reconstruction. On the other hand, from what I can gather, it seems like it's not going to happen anytime soon. So how do you hear some of these political questions? How would you try and address them? Well, first, bear in mind that Ukraine's application to the European Union, you're right, will take time of years before that's realized. But also consider the added the political attitudes of the other European nations in the European Union. Uh, they're not exactly that enthused, as far as I can tell, to be uh, socked with uh, years and years of reconstruction uh, payments uh, for Ukraine. I mean, they've already been through the pandemic. They put a lot of money out for the pandemic. They put a lot of money out for the 2007-2008 financial crisis, particularly in the southern rim nations of the European Union. Um, and so the added the the, the tolerance for um, uh, somehow Ukraine's admission into the European Union being sort of an open ATM for Ukraine to soak EU money into Ukraine, I don't say that critically. I just say that's the attitude that would be seen. Uh, we've got to be very careful about that. I would also point out that I think the situation with Russia is very different from Germany after yep. World War I and certainly after World War II. Namely, Russia is not a devastated country. It's, it's not destroyed. It has a, an economy uh, and it has oil wealth. And so uh, that is available for reparations. The question is how politically do you, do you, do you negotiate that how do you get cases in front of the International Court of Justice ordering such reparations? And that is the huge challenge, but that's part of the negotiating scenario with Russia. I do think it's absolutely implausible that the rest of the world is called upon to rebuild Ukraine when there is daily devastation of Ukraine by Russia and somehow Russia holds no liability financially for rebuilding Ukraine. That is an implausible argument to politicians. And I, I just, I, I think there has to be, that, that's the great challenge politically uh, in the future is how to negotiate uh, the, the, um, the liability of Russia for reparations. Well, on that note, um, thank you very much, Ambassador Sheffer. Thank you very much, Senator Omidivar. I'm gonna hand it back to my colleague, Yulia Panfil. Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you, Ambassador Shepper and uh, Senator Omidbar. I, I uh, invite all of the panelists to come back onto the screen. Um, I'd like to uh, thank everybody for your participation. Um, I also just wanted to make a um, slight uh, correction. I aired when uh, introducing Zarina, in addition to writing for Euromaidan Press, Zarina also writes for Byline Times. and. Uh, uh, produces videos for EBT, EBT News. Uh, but really, I just want to leave you with, um, you know, a few reflections on the resilience of the Ukrainian people who are beginning to rebuild and continuing to tend to their properties, even in the face of the destruction they're facing, and Ambassador Sheffer's uh, final words that it's inconceivable that the perpetrator of this devastation um, against Ukraine would not have to pay for the damage that they cause. Um, so thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, as final words, мы переможемо і ми відбудуємося. Слава Україні! Thank you. Героям слава! Героям слава!